Next on MLR Weekly, Dallas Jackals star Sam Goff, a Major League Rugby's best recap, audacious predictions from Brian Ray of America's Rugby News, and the latest headlines from Rugby Morning's John Fitzpatrick. Rugby Wrap-Up's MLR Weekly brought to you by Sheehy Auto Stores. It's easy at Sheehy. The Pig & Whistle, New York City. The world's best rugby pub. And Lean and & Limber, stretching your way to a healthier lifestyle. to MLR Weekly as presented by Rugby Wrap-Up. Matt McCarthy in New York City. Thank you for joining us. We have a great show. We don't think you'll be disappointed. We have Mr. Sam Gala of the now off the schneid Dallas Jackals. Google it. We have Brian Ray with his preview slash predictions. We have a rapid rousing recap. But before all of that, we have Mr. John Fitzpatrick of Rugby Morning with his coffee break MLR headlines. John, welcome. How are you? Hey, man, I'm doing great. Let's start in Dallas and talk about the Jackals and their very first win in franchise histories. Also, three cheers, though, to Toronto Arrows for not playing for the tying, going for the win at the end of the game. But, Matt, looking at the schedule, do you think Dallas will win another game this season? I do. Uh, Dallas is a better team than uh, than what their record indicates. They, should, they could have had three wins going into this one before they got the first one. And I think the teams have to rest players. They can't put their best teams out all the time. This is a marathon season. I think Dallas gets at least two more wins on the season. And their kits were winners in themselves. And I, I got I to gotta say, I think Toronto should have taken three points if they had the opportunity because in the East, points matter. Next! Points do matter. Let's stay in Dallas real quick. I just want to talk about the Toronto Arrows. You've got good times ahead for them. They are finally back home in round eight for their first home game of the season. They're taking on a banged up New York side that may be without wing Teofilo Fido and Pongo Heine. They're also missing Brendan O'Connor. So Matt, I gotta ask you, do you know Toronto's win percentage at home? I don't, but I do know what Toronto's lineup and roster looks like right now. And if you wanna talk injuries, you have to talk the Toronto Arrows because they are just decimated. So I got to say, New York is in a much better place physically and mentally coming off what they came off against Atlanta than Toronto is coming off what they came off in Dallas. Well, to answer the question, according to James Dealey of MLR Stats, the winning percentage for Toronto is 73%. So something to think about for your upcoming Rugby Odds episode. Well, the Mets lost in the World Series in 1973 to the Oakland A's. Next! Let's go to Chicago. As first reported by our colleague Brian Ray of America's Rugby News, there appeared to be some piped-in sound during the Chicago Hounds versus Houston Sabres broadcast. Turns out that extra sound was from the stadium DJ. So, Matt, listen to this. We had a called early game. We've had DJ cranking stadium noise. What the heck is going to happen next in Chicago? Let me just say this. Brian Ray lives in an igloo somewhere outside Halifax, and the only sounds that he hears are like a wolverine howl or a seal crying in the night. What does he know? Let's go to Utah, where the Warriors were very excited about their win over the New England Free Jacks, but there's potentially some bad news on the horizon here. I think they're awaiting a possible sighting of center Paul Asike. He had that head-to-head -head collision with New England Free Jacks wing Mitch Wilson. Wilson looked really banged up, had to leave the game early. Let's hope he's okay. We may hear in a little bit whether or not Lasique will be available in round eight. There are also some injury concerns for Utah. Wing Joe Mono, who had a hat trick in, in, in round six, he got off to a hot start in round seven, scoring a try in the first half. He had to leave early after uh, banging his head on the ground. And also lock Jamie Delane, he left the game early failing a head injury assessment there. So a big win for Utah, but they're going to be missing some prime players in a round eight matchup against the Houston Sabercats. Yeah, you don't want to be uh, weakened in any shape or form when you're facing those Sabercats, but we hope those players are okay. But both of us are going to admittedly take a hit in our fantasy Rutgers team because you have Mono and I have Lasique. Next! Matt, you know what? That's okay. My team is built for the long haul, and no matter what, we're going to get it done. So... 
back to you. Thank you uh, for your service uh, in the fantasy world and here, my friend. I am just honored to be in your presence once again. Thank you to Mr. John Fitzpatrick of Rugby Morning's Coffee Break. Now let's look back before we look ahead. Three of the six matches played were decided by three points or less. The first of which was in Utah on Friday night. If you're guilty of 13 penalties and a yellow card on the road in the Utahian altitude, yes, Utahian, you're making it hard on yourselves. The New England Free Jacks did just that, and the Warriors took full advantage and held on for dear life and an exciting win. Great atmosphere in Salt Lake City and the FJs escaped with a critical point in the Eastern Conference. Meanwhile, the Mountain people served notice that reports of their demise were premature. There were two things that certainly didn't help the injury ravaged Toronto Arrows. Number one, they were on the road again, this time in Dallas. And number two, they were facing a gaggle of wounded jackals. That's a jackal gaggle in their den. In the Windy City, the Houston Sabercats needed a yellow card to get their Sabercat engines, wait for it, purring. Really bad cat puns aside, the team from Space City was just too much to handle for the hometown hounds. Chicago star Mark O'Keefe did get the home team crowd going with an electrifying try, likely because he was on MLR Weekly last week. It was not enough though, and Houston won easily, 38-21. Down in the Big Easy, the Seattle Seawolves swam into the bayou and were getting eaten alive by the Nola Gold in the first half. The home team bashed their way to a 28-10 lead and had the man advantage when they let Seattle back in the match. The Pacific Northwesterners swam upstream to spawn in the tri-zone repeatedly and take a 36-28 lead. Noah managed to get it over the whitewash one more time, but it was not enough, and a mere point separated the victors from the losers. Seattle remains perfect and gets a bonus point win, and Nola collects two key bonus points in the 36-35 loss. On the border of the Boogie Down Bronx in New York City, the Ironworkers and Rugby ATL locked horns in a match that both teams needed to win. Under sunny Mount Vernon skies, this was a thrilling back and forth epic battle. It wasn't until late in the game, however, when New York was able to pull away. This very physical match saw both teams lose key players that could impact the rest of the season. The New Yorkers picked up the five-point bonus win while Atlanta left with nothing. Final score, 31 to 20. Down at Oh Snap Dragon Stadium in Southern California, Old Glory DC was up against it. The Legion had but one loss and were coming off a bye, yet Washington scored first and went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the hometown heavyweights. The league's only California team were led by Mikey Teo, whose name roughly translates into keg with very fast feet. The Legion win big and Ma'ananu gives our pals John and Jay Rizzo something to talk about for the rest of their lives. Okay, let's take a quick break and come back with Dallas Jackal star, Sam Goff. When we pick up the ball, we also pick up a legacy. A legacy that stretches beyond your current team. A legacy built on the backs of those who came before you with hard work. And for those who will come after you, we promise it won't be easy, but we'll be there, supporting you on and off the field. Ladies and gentlemen, before we continue, just a quick note. Uh, we get a bunch of feedback from fans, like uh, thoughts, criticisms, ideas, and it's all appreciated. But we got a gem of a suggestion from Pat Holney, Chicago Hound superfan, and the twin brother of the much cooler Peter Holney, about yours truly. I know my name's Pat Holney, and I'm part of the Chicago Blue. And 
I'm a Chicago Hounds fan. Arr, arr, arr. Hey, Matt. Come on, guy. Pull it down, bro. Pull it down, my man. Pull down the jacket. When I sit down in the chair, before we shoot, I should reach down, pull my suit jacket down, and sit on it so that my shoulders don't look puffy on camera. And I got to tell you, that is some of the best advice we've gotten. Kudos to you, Mr. Chicago Hound superfan, uh, Pat uh, Holney. Uh. Today, you're almost as cool as your twin brother, Peter. With that, let's move on. And we are back with Mr. Sam Gala of the Dallas Jackals. Sam, welcome to MLR Weekly. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here, Sam. You had a hat trick of accomplishments in one weekend. First and foremost, your team got its first ever franchise victory. Number two, you passed the threshold of 100 tackles. Not in one game. That would be a lot. But I yeah, think you're at 104 right now. But, you know, maybe you got a 100 tackle game in you in the future. I'm not going to say no. Uh, <laughs> and number three, it's your second consecutive week being in the MLR starting 15. Not a bad weekend. Yeah. Not bad. Not bad at all. <laughs> that's mostly, it. That's that's it. That's a, okay. All right. Mostly proud for the team. That's that's the mo that's the biggest thing for me. You know, everyone, reserves included, coaches. We've been just working so hard so to finally get a win. Uh, that's by far been the most important thing to me, um, especially going into a bye week as well. Uh, I just feel like we definitely deserve something to end on a good note before going into our next block. So that was the most important thing. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, you know, I've, I had the pleasure of calling your game in New England and you guys could have won that one. Very so That was a gut-wrenching loss for you guys. I was tr trying not to, to vomit my mouth for you in the booth. Prior to that, you had the loss in Chicago, another gut-wrenching loss. And in Utah, you could have won that one. So you could have had three wins going into this one. Yeah. Three, three close games. Uh, the fact that we persevered too through like two really close losses and then continued to, you know, push through. Um, if anything, that just, you know, makes me more confident in the team. Um, again, so sad, <laughs> so hard, so hard to, you know, be so close so many times and then continue to, you know, push forward and forward and forward and finally get that win. But yeah, um, it's been a, it's been a tough season, um, but I'm just glad we finally got that monkey off our back. Um, got to win. Got rid of that zero on our streak. And then uh, now we're finally, you know, we're in this a little bit more than what we were before. So let me let's go back to that, because, you know, they were back breaking losses. Let's let's not sugarcoat it. Yeah. Right. And yet, yeah. as you say, you guys had the resiliency to come back and bounce back. Who's leading that charge? How do you how do you stay together? How do you start not punching each other in the face? Right. I mean, what, <laughs> right. I mean, you got because you you stayed together and yeah. you pulled it off. Celebrating the small wins was definitely the first thing as a team coming off of the 0-16 season. There's a lot of work to be done. So recognizing when we do things right, studying that, learning from it. And then um, there has to be really good leadership as well. I think Hedo, who's our captain, the number six, he's doing a great job. Um, he's leading by example, which is probably one of the most important things to do as a captain, um, playing 80 minute games back to back to back, making sure that we stay close after those close losses. Um, the last thing you wanna do is have the whole team spread out, kind of go into their own zone. Um, it's definitely, important to make sure that everyone you know stays as one cohesive unit um and i think he's done great with that so far and then especially the coaching staff just not giving up on us you know <laughs> continuing to not give us the easy route um after a loss work even harder so you know the trainings have been brutal um just not you know not giving us any like room to you know sit back and be like yeah like we lost like maybe we're not that good like, no, there's been none of that. That's all been, you are good enough. You can win. We're there. We've shown it. We've proven it. Even if we've lost by a point or two, we had that game. So just know that. Um, so just a lot of positive reinforcement. And, hey, after seven games, you know, 
you did it. Yeah, it was uh, it was really a credit to the program to see you guys hold hold a, hold on and get that win. Just now, you break into the open, and you've got nothing but green and the posts in front of you. Do you remember in that second that you can get an automatic seven by putting it down? Or is that, or are you just saying I'm? I'm oh, gonna... I, I I knew that we could get okay. an automatic seven. Yeah. So you... I part of me was like, should I go to the side of the post or um, give us like a little bit of time to rest? It was already like a really close game, and then uh, we've just had tries in the past where we've missed conversions. You got to take those. You I was like, I was you like, I'm gonna take those come two on, points. really? You're yeah, thinking of going um, to the I side? Also did, I also did do, know that like at the clock is about 20 minutes, so we did a water break after. So um, it was like, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna take those seven, <laughs> and then. Um, for the forwards, I had to dive. You know, I just had to. I had to jump in the air for the big ass. <laughs> Of course, but but hold on. Are you saying that you were looking at this, the scoreboard at the same time, looking at the clock, or did you know that before you picked up the ball? I knew that before. I, I knew we were at uh, – we had a line out, like, a little bit before. And we were at, like, minutes 17. Okay. So we were close to the 20-minute mark, which is usually when we get the water break. Right. And then um, after I scored the seven, I was like, I think we're pretty close. And I looked up, and since he already had a stoppage, like, from the try – the ref just called the water break. I think it was minute 19, uh, 18, 19. So it wasn't the full 20, but uh, he called the water break right there. So it ended up working out pretty well. <laughs> okay. So as the number one pick in the MLR draft in 2022, you're out of Cal. We're used yep. to winning. You, you've coached by the legend that is Jack Clark and his, his assistant coach, Tom Billups, two legends of the game, right? Yep. Um, what when when you're on the pitch like that, what what are you drawing on from from your previous history? Because you're not used to losing. <laughs> yeah, that's a I've asked myself that question as well. Um, I've actually talked to my parents about it too. Um, coming from a very prestigious university with such a track record i mean i think jack clark's winning like two thousand years of winning pretty much right yeah i mean i think his winning percentage is like 90 percent, which is phenomenal right. you know like that's that's a unicorn of a coach i think senior year i had we had one loss this against st mary's and it just destroyed me and then to like come here and then you know back to back losses alone is like it's a lot i felt like the team knew how to lose in a positive manner, which is really important. That's something Cal taught me. Clark does a great job of letting his players know that like, if you're going to lose a game, you better lose it with the utmost respect. All right. Let's, let's, uh, let's go back a little bit in time. So you picked up the game playing in high school in Denver, but you're yes. originally, you're born in Arlington, Texas, which is where you're playing. And yeah. So you're ba you're back home, but how old were you when you left Texas? Yeah, maybe two or three. I was really young. My uh, dad got a new job in Denver, and he was like, "Yeah, let's let's head out of here." And then I grew up in Denver. So Denver's more of my, you know, like hometown where I grew up. Uh, but like born here in Arlington, and then again, I came back a lot. My uncle lived here for a pretty long time on my dad's side, um, so I came and visited a decent amount. Saw like my old neighborhood a lot, met my old neighbors, and then that's great. My old neighbors actually bought season tickets, so <laughs> yeah, so uh, they they come to the game sometimes, which is really cool to see. If you weren't playing professional rugby, what sport would you want to play professionally? Right before I started playing rugby, I was going to play American football, but um, I never really like made the jump. It was just like rugby all year round. So I was like doing like sevens and fifteens, and then my friend who played football, um, he was like, "Come to tryouts," and I was like, literally like out the door, and I was like, "You know what? Nah." <laughs> and then I never ended up going. Uh, my mom was pretty happy about it. She did not want me playing football. She had and no then, idea what rugby was then, right? Yeah. So yeah. it was either football or um, I actually was a really good swimmer. Uh, yeah. So I actually won. Um, some state titles only did it for like two or three years. And then I was like, I can't do this anymore. The meets were oh, too long. Yeah. 
it was very individual sport. Um, and then I was like, yeah, I just quit. And then my mom was like, you better find a sport. <laughs> and then I found rugby because uh, my sister was going to East at the time and they were in the state championship. And she's like, I'm going to state championship. Like you should come watch. And I was like, this looks awesome. And then I signed up like literally a week later. Holla for Gala, ladies and gentlemen. Sam Gala of the Dallas Jackals. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. And we will be right back with Mr. Brian Ray of America's Rugby News with previews of what's ahead. If you're in New York City and want to watch some great rugby, have some great food, and some great times, go to the world's best rugby pub, The Pig and Whistle on West 36th Street. This is the Rugby Odds, where an unlikely pundit panel of a wordsmith, a WWE legend, a rugby star, and a supermodel scour the globe, seeking best bets and bad behavior. Are you not entertained? I'm Will Leonard, and you're watching the Rugby Channel. That's what is it? First of all, that's not loud, <laughs> and second, it's the Rugby Wrap Up Channel. The rugby Wrap Up Channel. And we are back, and we are back with Mr. Brian Ray of America's Rugby News, who is now the number one Dallas Jackals fan. Welcome, Brian. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I think I don't know. I, I, I kind of feel a little bit <laughs> unwelcome hearing this little trash talk going on. Well, you know, you you we were bash in Chicago. It's called sports entertainment. It's not sports like what you have up in the. It's not like you going to see a Halifax Hounds game and telling everybody to be quiet so you can hear the ball hit the ground. Uh, it was amazing to hear the actual crowd in the second half of that game. Thankfully, this rogue stadium DJ was corrected after what are, you, what are you talking about it's not rogue it's like Fake every noise. have you ever been to a baseball game everybody clap your hands and you hear the clapping it's not you can look around your section nobody's clapping but they're still clapping that's it's why called nobody sports entertainment come on what <laughs> baseball whatever you go to a hockey game do you think they're cheering in phoenix for the coyotes no <laughs> Okay, <laughs> they're not. And I guarantee you there is piped in cheering in your Toronto Maple Leafs games. Never, never, ever happens. Stop. Anyway, the schedule. We bitch about it a lot. I like this one. Four games in a row. And then you have the last, the fourth game is at the same time as the other 8 p.m. game, unfortunately. Uh, but all on Saturday. We had so many good games on, on this past Sunday all at the same time, and you kind of only had to watch one of them, you know, which was unfortunate because they were yeah. all great. Um, but, yeah. And I know you chose nice the New York-Atlanta one because I was calling it. I know you did <laughs> yeah, that. there you go. Anywho, New England hosting the Hounds. New England's number one issue this season right now is their discipline pretty clearly. But, hey, that was a spectacular game uh, against Utah. I mean, for me, that was the game of the season, even – given the games that we ended up seeing on Sunday, which were great as well. But I just thought the intensity, the actual crowd noise, the atmosphere there, uh, both teams were, were into it, uh, super exciting. Um, but yeah, I know New England, uh, they'll be a little bit disappointed not to come away with that one with a win. I, I think uh, I think it was certainly within their grasp, but the discipline just didn't didn't uh, you know fail them a little bit again. So I'm sure there'll be words to that extent during the week, no doubt. And uh Chicago, yeah, I mean, they're just not, not quite there yet, right, are they? But, but, you know, John Cullen has come in now. I think he really helped in that game. You know, it wasn't like they completely laid down against Houston. They just have some things to work on. But uh, on the road against New England, I don't see that happening. So i going to take the free jacks there. The next one is, uh, it looks like it's your Tirana Arrows hosting their first home game. It was great to see New York rebound. And, you know, that end of the game was really exciting. But it was terrible those first few minutes of the game when they lost Fido and, and Pongo and uh, you know O'Connor not playing in that as well I mean they're going to be a bit beaten up and, and one day less uh, 
of rest than, than the Arrows, who are going to be absolutely ecstatic to be at home and have some bodies. Both teams a bit banged up in this one. Uh, a lot of energy, obviously, will go to Toronto for being at home. Uh, New York are going to feel like they have to win this one to keep uh, kind of keep pace. I mean, they're not too far back right now, but uh, but you don't want to get behind too much either. So a uh, big game. I think New York has to go in this one as favorites. Uh, an intriguing match, uh, nonetheless. This one, you know, I said it about New York and Atlanta. That was a must win for New York and Atlanta. Well, now Atlanta is doubly in that scenario, but so is all glory. And I think all glory can sneak this one. It wasn't like, again, both of them were competitive last week. It wasn't like they were blown out. It's just a few mistakes here and there. Uh, you know, Old Glory showed, a, you know, a bit of character coming out. I mean, they were really getting run around for the first, you know, 15, 20 minutes of that second half. And then, bang, they got two tries right away. So they never gave up in that game. And that's, a, you know, that's a credit to their character. And ATL, you know, they just... They just didn't quite click, did they, against New York? And they haven't really this season. They had a lot of moving parts. Uh, we'll see if Kurt Coleman is back. He's a big part of that team. So uh, this is a tough one to call. Um, you know, I, I kind of like your your idea there. I think DC may be a little, uh, have a little bit more behind them right now. And uh, yeah, I'm going to go with DC on the road over ATL in this one. Tough call. It's going to be a good game, but I'm going to go with DC. Then we have our first of two 8 p.m. Eastern starts. And two good games. We have Seattle hosting San Diego. Yeah, I feel bad for the other game because this is the one that everybody's going to be watching who isn't in attendance in Texas. But, uh, wow, what a huge, huge game. I mean, that game, Seattle-Houston, was a big one. But this is just a, another step up. I mean, these are the top two teams in MLR right now. I don't think any too many would. I mean, this is a case for Houston maybe. But if you look at the standings, these are the top two. Seattle unbeaten. San Diego just seemed to be able to turn it on, you know, almost at will. I mean, that performance at times against D.C., they just looked untouchable. They were just sensational rugby they're playing. Uh, but Seattle are so tough. I mean, to go down 18 points against a NOLA team that was looking pretty sharp, uh, you know, and, and, and come back from that uh, to get that kind of win, uh, that's a real champion's mentality. The, the performance from the, the guys off the bench, Mason Peterson and Jake Turnbull, both props scoring great tries. Uh, that's the kind of impact you want to see if you're a champion, uh, you know, a team contending for a title. And, uh, man, this is a great game, but I got to go Seattle, though. Houston hosting the Utah Warriors, who are a formidable rugby team. Jeez, and Houston, they look pretty clinical against Chicago again. I mean, they look good. The week, I mean, they look good all season. They just, they're so well-rounded. You know, we got used to talking about the really tough Sabercats scrum and, uh, you know, their pack really, uh, you know, so physical and big and, but those backs are just <laughs> almost as good this year. I mean, Dom Aquina and Lava Skagney and Christian Dyer and Drew Wild. I mean, yeah. these guys have threats all over the pitch. But then Utah, you got Joe Mano who's playing, you know, absolutely lights out. And hopefully he's okay for this one because he failed his HIA. So, you know, if they're missing Mano, that would be a blow. And this is a tough game. Uh, but Utah on the road in Houston against a Sabercats team that is just firing in all cylinders. Got to go with Houston. Thank you, Mr. Brian Ray of America's Rugby News. Thank you to John Fitzpatrick of Rugby Morning. And thank you to Sam Gala of the Dallas Jackals. And thank you for tuning in. Please check out our other shows, including the Rugby Odds, the College Rugby Wrap-Up. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Please join our weekly newsletter and sign up for our American Red Cross Blood Donor Team.